Well, last week I gave you some good news and some bad news to start with, especially the good news and bad news that pastors uh, sometimes hear. I've decided to give good news and bad news in the context of a doctor. Is that okay? So uh, a doctor came in and told the patient, he said, I've got some good news and bad news. And the patient said, well, give me the good news first. And he said, well, the good news, sir, is that you've got 24 hours to live. And he said, well, if that's the good news, what's the bad news? And he said, well, I've been trying to call you all day yesterday and it was busy. <laughs> yeah. Here's another one. A man is waiting in the doctor's office, and when the doctor comes in, he said, there's good news and there's bad news concerning your health. Which would you like first? <clears throat> he said, the patient said, well, give me the good news first. He said, well, the good news is we're naming a disease after you. <laughs> in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10, Paul uh, really doesn't give us a chance to choose between the good news and the bad news. He just, he just lays it on the, uh, on the line with the bad news first, doesn't he? You don't get to choose. And uh, last Sunday, I, I hated to do that to you. I, I'm really sorry that, that I had to spend the entire sermon on the bad news. But can I tell you, I, when I started, I, I hope you realize that, that I wasn't going to tickle your ears uh, if you want your ears tickled, there's plenty of televangelists on TV on Sunday mornings. Uh, you can hear something fun, and, and, and everybody's healthy and wealthy and happy, and, and uh, they'll give it to you. But I just think if it's in the Scripture, I'm going to deal with it. And uh, it's pretty serious business, what Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter 1, that we all uh, were born... In sin, and it was a pretty bad news. I, I'm sorry that I, I kind of ruined your Nazarene nap. Maybe that kind of affected the Chiefs game last Sunday. I don't know, but uh, it, it was a pretty bad day last Sunday. I had to deal with sin Sunday morning, and then I had to deal with that game uh, Sunday afternoon. But we won't get there. But I do would like I would like for you to stand. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter two. We're going to read all of one through ten. Uh, Last week, we read 1 through 4, which was just the bad news. But I'm going to start with the bad news again, because that makes the good news oh so much better, doesn't it? So, my friends, this is the word of the Lord. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and, it is, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good, good news, good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you. So Paul starts out giving us all of the bad news. It's in verses 1 through 4. He first says, listen, you guys, uh, we were all dead. We were like the opposite of what we were created to be. We were totally separate from our creator. We, we were so dead, we couldn't even respond to the grace and the love of God. That's how dead we were. 
When we, are, when we live in sin, we don't even have the ability to raise our eyes and recognize that there, that there is a God who loves us. That's how bad it was. He also said, listen, you're, you and we were deceived. We were controlled by the world, this world which in, encourages disobedient. We were controlled by the father of lies, the prince of the power of, the, of air, and we were disobedient. The world encouraged our disobedience. The devil encouraged our disobedience. The flesh encourages our disobedient disobedience because we were born with this natural bent towards sin. It just comes naturally for us to sin. And then he said we're depraved. We actually enjoyed our sin. The lust, the flesh, indulging, desire, flesh, children's of, children of wrath. These were the words that Paul used about us. We were just depraved people. And then he ends with, he says, you're doomed. We deserved wrath, said Paul. We were children of disobedience. And later in another book in Romans 6.23, he said, the wages of sin is death. But can I tell you, I am so glad that Paul didn't leave us in that bad news portion of 1 through 4. He goes on and gives us the good news. There's a picture. Uh, it's, the, it's a famous picture of, uh, of a chess player that you'll see on the right who is playing chess with the devil. And uh, a master chess champion was walking by and he saw this painting and it fascinated him. It was a painting that uh, signifying this, uh, signified this, this life battle of a, uh, of a man fighting for his life with the devil who, and they show it in a chess scene. The painting was named Checkmate, and it's, it's today found in the, in the Louvre Museum in Paris. It's painted by a guy by the name of Friedrich Moritz August Rich. And uh, there was this look of glee in the face of the enemy and, and, a, 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 and a face of panic by the man who looked like he was just about to lose this chess game. The story goes that as the master chess champion observed the painting, he began to get very uncomfortable. The chess champion recognized that there was something wrong with the painting. He called the curator of the gallery and demanded to meet with the artist who had painted this piece. They decided on a time to meet in a quiet room they brought the, the painting. The master chess champion arrived early to the meeting and he set up his own chessboard exactly as it was portrayed in the painting. When the artist arrived, he sat down at the chessboard and the artist said, there's something wrong with, their paint, with your painting. And when the artist inquired as to what that might be the champion began to say, you have entitled this checkmate. But that implies that the young man has no more moves and he is just about to lose. The chess champion reached over to the board and moved the man's king one space. And he said, the devil is now checkmated. When the king has one more move, the game is not over. Can I tell you? After Satan celebrated, after verses 1 through 4, it was just a horrible, dark story of sin and destruction for all of us. And I imagine as, as Satan was looking over 
uh, Paul, as he was writing that horrible news about us, Satan was celebrating and he was saying, yes, you're dead. Yes, you're, de- you're disobedient. Yes, you're depraved and deceived and doomed. But Jesus got involved in that story and he said, wait, devil. You are now checkmated. The king has one more move. The game is not over. Thanks be to God. Can I tell you the good news? There is life because of the gift of Christ. There is life because of the gift of Christ. After Paul had painted such a horrible picture of bad news, Paul totally changed the story in just two words. In the NIV, it says, but God, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he saved us. Can I tell you, everything changed with those two words. Uh, some people have hobbies like playing baseball or, or carving things or mechanic work, hobbies of running or whatever. One of my hobbies is a Bible study exercise, and that is to find but God in the Scripture. It's, it's, it's what I call divine interventions. When God comes in the scene and radically changes the story, I listed four or five of them in the Friday Focus. If you haven't signed up to receive that devotional every Friday morning, I'd encourage you to write on the RSVP and put your email address. But there there are dozens of those throughout the Bible, and this is one of the most key ones. When everything was dark and black and sinful and awful, and then God shows up. And changes everything. And can I just tell you, I put a symbol beside that. Those of you who like to write in your Bibles, I I make a, a mark like this and I put an arrow at the top and an arrow at the bottom. Because I want to remember this is a significant Uh, change. It's a conditional phrase. It's a divine intervention of God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love which he saved us, changed everything. But God right here means everything to those of us who lived on the bad side of life. And can I just say, all of us did. All of us lived there. We were dead, but God made us alive. We were devilish, but God raised us out of the evil world. We were depraved, but God seated us with Christ, and he gave us a new nature. We were deceived, but God told us the truth. We were doomed, but God gifted us life. Thanks be to God. God had the last move. It was the work of Christ that changed everything. What was the power that God used to transform from death to life. It's found in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. You see, our salvation was based on mercy. Now, I want to give you a definition of mercy because... uh, Often it's confused with grace, and later I'm going to give you a definition of grace, but I encourage you, write this in the the white spaces of your Bible, because it's a very important, very simple definition of mercy. Mercy is God holding back what I deserve. Mercy is God holding back what I deserve. You see, if we received what we deserved, we would all be in trouble, wouldn't we? We all deserve the wrath of God. We all deserve destruction. We all deserve hell. But thanks be to God, because of the mercy of God, he holds it back from us. Napoleon was uh, was riding through the 
the streets of Paris when a lady ran up to him and asked if he would spare the, the life of her son who was in prison. Napoleon asked for her son's name, and when she gave him the name, the great general said, don't you realize that your son is a traitor and deserves death? But the mother responded, sir, I am not asking for justice. I am asking for mercy. I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking that you would withhold what he deserves. Psalms 86, 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Again, what was the power that God used to transform us from death to life? It's based on mercy, withholding what you truly do deserve. But also your salvation is, is motivated by God's love. God doesn't look down from heaven and say, there's a good person, I'll let her in heaven. There's a good man. Yeah, you come on to heaven too because I like you. You see, God doesn't do that because salvation, listen, salvation has nothing to do with your goodness. Salvation has nothing to do with, good, with your goodness. It has nothing to do with your education. It has nothing to do with what country you grew up in or your social standing. Certainly nothing to do with your bank account has nothing to do with your good upbringing. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, it has nothing to do, listen, understand me, it has nothing to do with your church attendance. It has nothing to do with whether you tithe or not and how generous you are. Instead, instead, God reaches down to all of us while we were bad, while we lived in sin, while we enjoyed living in our sin. Remember, we were depraved. And he sees through these eyes of mercy, withholding what we deserve, withholding the punishment that we all really needed, and he responded with love. It's love that even while we were vile, even while we were sinful, lustful, ungrateful, unworthy, unholy, degraded, and deprived, even then, God forgave us. Even then, he sent his only son because of his love for us sent his only son on the cross. It was his loving act at Calvary that God displayed his hatred for sin and his love for sinners. Amen? That's good news. So by what authority did God give us life? Remember, asking questions of the story, asking questions of the Bible is exactly the best way to get good out of it. That's what I'm doing in the sermon. I'm asking questions of it. By what authority did God give us life? Well, notice that Paul repeats something five times, uh, yeah, five times in these 10 verses. See if you can find the common denominator. Verse six, and God raised us up with Christ. In verse six, he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And in, in later in 6, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incom, uh, incomparable riches of his or Christ's grace. In verse 7, he expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. In verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. What was the common denominator? It was in Christ Jesus. That's the authority. Not by works, he says in verse 9. It's not by works that you receive this. 
lest any man should boast. You can do absolutely nothing to make God love you more. And you can do absolutely nothing to make God love you any less. Can you wrap your arms around that? We can't do anything to make God love us anymore. And we can't do anything to make God love us any less. Can I just tell you, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you've sinned against. It doesn't matter what you've done to your body or someone else's body. It doesn't matter what crimes you've committed. It doesn't matter what lies you've told. Not a single one of those sins has made God love you any less. But can I also tell you, you can help an old lady across the street all you want. God's not going to love you more. You can even pick her up and carry her across the street. He's not going to love you anymore. We can't do good works enough to make God love us more. God loves us all the same. Salvation can't be of works because the work of salvation has already been completed on the cross. It's already been done. The work, uh, this was a work of Christ, not our work. This was a work on the cross, not a work of, uh, uh, of good works, of our actions. This was a finished work, not a salvation that has to be continually earned. We can't do anything to gain this salvation. We dare not take anything away from it as well. It was a finished work of Christ on the cross. So by what means did God save us? Well, it says in verse 8, for it is by grace. What was that? It was by grace that you have been saved. Through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So he saved us by grace. Here's another definition to write on the flyleaf of your Bible. Grace means unmerited favor. It's as simple as that. Mercy is God withholding from us what we really deserve. But grace is favor, unmerited favor. We don't deserve it, but God gives it to us anyway. So grace is God doing good for us even though we do not deserve it. Because of God's grace, I receive eternal life and a promise of heaven though I do not deserve it and it's for you as well. Salvation isn't by works that I have done but by the grace of God that he provides. And then he says he saved us through faith for by grace you have been saved by faith. Some people talk about saving faith. This is really a wrong understanding. Faith doesn't save you. Faith is the handle by which we get a hold of salvation. Faith is the hand that reaches out and takes hold of that which has been offered by grace. It is by faith that enables us to be saved. So grace and faith they're a perfect match, aren't they? Grace is God reaching down from heaven, offering what we do not deserve. And faith is us reaching up and saying, I believe and I accept the gift that you're given me by love. So when God's hand of grace reaches your hand of faith, there's a match made in heaven. It's God's grace and our faith that provides a salvation. And that, my friends, is really, really good news. Would you please stand?
Now, you've probably heard me preach. I don't know if you've been here every Sunday. I've been preaching for nine months or so. I'm not done preaching when I have you stand. There's good scripture still left. And Paul is not done. We have to look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ. Now that's a, a good passage and we've, a lot of us have memorized it in, in Bible camp, VBS. But it comes to life when you begin to look at the, or the original language that Paul used, which was Greek. Especially when you look at that word workmanship. Workmanship, if you look at the Greek word, it's the word poema. Poema. In English, we, we use the word poem. It speaks of the manufacturing or the, the creative process of bringing a product to life. Basically, it says, we are God's poem created by Christ. <laughs> In other words, our conversion is not the end. It's the beginning. We are a part of God's new creation. He's continuing to melt us and mold us and refine us and make us who he really wants us to be, a new creation. His purpose, listen, God's purpose is to make us more like Christ. We are his poem as he's molding and melting and reviewing and taking out that which is bad and putting in that which is good and making us Christ-like, his poem. Can I ask you a question? Are you living in the bad news part of this passage? My guess is if you were here last Sunday, this last week was probably a, a miserable week because the Holy Spirit was beginning to work on you. And can I just say, when you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that's the love of God working in you. What a gift that is. Because by yourself, depraved as we all are, we have no ability to even recognize our sin. But God loved you enough that he provided his Holy Spirit to convict and push and provide sleepless nights and remind us of the bad news. Perhaps some of you are living in the good news. Thanks be to God, who by his grace, through his love, provided us salvation. We're going to sing a song this morning, and can I just say this is a perfect day for you to move from the, the bad news and then enter that but God season when God changes everything and provides salvation for you. Now, if you'd like to come to the altar as we sing, we would love to gather around you. Perhaps you want to get somebody that you know, love, and trust, and they'll come down with you, or just sit where you are, and God will meet you, and we'll gather around you and pray. Please come as we sing. Bye. 
Father, we are so thankful that we do not have to live in the bad news of verses 1 through 4. We are so thankful for verse 4, where you enter the scene, but God, because of your love for us, we could be radically changed. And Father, we are so thankful that you withhold what we deserve and you provide what we don't deserve. We thank you that you sent your only son that we might by faith accept what he did on the cross, a finished work of salvation, that we might be forgiven, cleansed, and set on a new path of life. We thank you, Jesus, for that privilege. And Father, if there are any here this morning who have not yet accepted you as their personal Savior, I pray that they would recognize your work in their hearts even today, and they would bow before you because a day will come when every person will bow before you, whether in heaven or on earth. And so I choose to bow today. Father, we love you, and it's our privilege to be loved by you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Would you receive this benediction? Good news and bad news. Only those who have by faith reached out to the grace-filled hand of the Father receives his salvation. And my prayer for each of you is that your heart could sing with personal appreciation of the song of the sinner saved by grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now <laughs> I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. My friends, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace for he has already gone before you. You're dismissed.